Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for being here. It must I'm be Kevin S. Taylor. If they must be special if they close down the bar. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that may be bad. <laughs> so help, hope everybody is uh, feeling good and had an enjoyable day. Um, so, you know, I run a, a platform called The Undefeated, so I have my own notebooks. When you run a platform, you can develop your own no notebooks with our brand on them. These are my questions in here. And I talked to Taylor early, and these are his questions for himself. Um, you, we're going to start with, because I know you have a story to tell, um, how did you get into writing, and why was race your focus? I got into writing by uh, an epiphany or an accident, I'm not quite sure, and it was exactly 50 years ago this weekend. I was not meant to spend most of my life um, studying race or, or be a writer at all. I grew up in segregated Atlanta. Um, my father was a dry cleaner. Um, the civil rights movement was going on all through my childhood. I was in the first grade the year of the Brown decision. And I graduated from college in 68, the spring that Dr. King was killed, and all in between uh, the civil rights movement was challenging people and people were afraid. Um, white people were afraid, black people were afraid. A lot of people who say they were in it are lying. Um, it was an incredible time, but it wore me down, and I'll get into it a little later, and changed the direction of my life's interest against my will because I wanted to know where it came from, particularly in the spring of 63 when I saw dogs and fire hoses loosed on young children in Birmingham, which I believe was a turning point in American history. Not recognized as such, but I believe it was. Most of those kids, they were as young as six. I talked to some of them. Uh, they were mostly girls. Um, and it kind of stunned me. I wanted to know where it came from, and I didn't get an answer. Anyway, 50 years ago, I was a graduate student at Princeton. And in the summer, you were supposed to work at the, Woodrow, at the World Bank or the Ford Foundation or somewhere. For, and I felt that the civil rights movement that had affected me so much was, it was the year after Dr. King was killed. I talked them in to letting me do a summer job that was not, as they called it, policy oriented. I registered voters in South Georgia for John Lewis and Vernon Jordan at the Voter Education Project. They said that they had 20 counties in far southwest Georgia that were so tiny that they didn't even have any names on their Rolodexes for contacts who might be willing and able to run a voter registration project. And if I would go down there in the course of a summer and give no more than three days to each of these counties and try to go out and find somebody, blind, sight unseen, they would give me car money, and I think $10 a day. I, I was so happy. Uh, and so ignorant. Um, <laughs> Columbus was not more lost when he set out west on his ship than I was when I drove into South Georgia thinking that because I'd seen the voter registration after the Voting Rights Act in 1965 on television that everybody was registered. Uh, the statistics told me different, but they couldn't prepare me for the experience of driving into each of these tiny little counties where the courthouse was and, a, and the Confederate monument and finding the black part of town and finding the Baptist church and hoping I could knock on the door and find the next Martin Luther King, which was a formula for failure. Um, many people told me that they had things well under control. I said, well, there's nobody registered to vote here. I uh, and they said, we have it in hand. Uh, nothing worked. A month later, after many adventures, I got arrested in a place called Bubba Doo's Big Apple, and <laughs> it was a juke joint because uh, I was trying to get the rebels uh, in a poker game to be interested in voter registration. That didn't work either. Um, but after a month, I started just going out in each county. I would go out in cornfields and talk to people, and most of the people working in the fields were women. And um, they started saying, I was asking them, do you know anybody that might be interested in trying to register voters in your county? And um, 
Finally, in Schley County, it's a tiny county. Georgia has 159 counties, and a lot of them are tiny. This woman said there's an old 1900s person here, and she, if anybody would do it, it would be her. So they gave me the directions how to get to her place, kind of southern style, go to the end of this road, and if you see a tree on the right, don't stop there, go to the next one, and you know, make your way up. And sure enough, there was this lady, an elderly lady, rocking on her porch, and I went up and introduced myself and told her I was working for the voter education project um, about voter registration, and could I talk to her, and was, did she know anybody who was interested? And she didn't say anything. She didn't say hello. She just rocked. And um, so I kept trying to explain what it was about and that this was important um, and that all I wanted, I didn't want a commitment, but could, did she, could she get some people together to talk about it? And after what seemed like an eternity, the first words out of her mouth were, do you really believe that we landed on the moon last night? <laughs> That's the first thing she said. And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. I was happy she said something. Yes, ma'am, I do. I saw it on Walter Cronkite back at the motel. And she didn't say anything. She just started rocking again. And so I'm mystified. Why is this the only thing she said? So I tried to explain voter registration a little more. Uh, and it seemed like an eternity later, the next words out of her mouth were, have you seen the Simon Eyes wax commercial? Uh, now I'm really thrown, but I'm thinking about it, and I remember there was a commercial. I said, you mean the one where the little children float across the kitchen floor on an invisible shield of simonized wax, and they don't scuff the floor because they're on an invisible shield? She didn't say anything, but I knew that's what she was. But now I'm hesitating because, you know, I, I said, I, I have seen that, but that was an advertisement. I believe they can make it look like they're doing that on the Simon Eyes Wax. But I saw the moon landing on a news show. So now I'm trying to explain the difference between a news show and the Simon Eyes Wax thing. She hasn't said anything. And so I explained that for a while, and she kept rocking. And, and I don't know if some of you are grad students. If you're a grad student, the more nervous you get, the more big words you use. So, <laughs> I started talking to her about how the Voter Education Project was a 501c3 tax-deferred <laughs> thing, and that we had these projects, and that you had minimal uh, reporting responsibilities and everything. And the third thing she said, and this had to be 15 minutes later, was, uh, have you ever been in a fist fight? <laughs> and, and, and I said, yes, ma'am, I've been, I've been in a fist fight. And she said, where more than one tooth gets knocked out at a time. And, and, so now she's qualifying the, the fist fight. Anyway, this conversation went on for most me talking and her only saying a few things that had me tied up in knots because I knew that I was off balance, but that she, she was saying something profound. Um, she finally, at the end of, I won't go through the whole thing, because um, she finally said, I can prove to you that we didn't land on the moon last night. She said, if we landed on the moon, then all we had to do was fill up our tank, and on the next jump, we could make it into heaven. And you know God wouldn't let us do that, so we didn't land on the moon. Um, by that time, I knew what she meant was that voting in her county to the bone marrow was life and death. There was a reason that no black people were vote, registered in Schley County or any of the other counties I went to. And it didn't care about the Voting, the voting Rights Act. Uh, and that she was not gonna risk her people on the word of a 22-year-old grad student who's explaining uh, how tax-deferred uh, foundations work. Um, but the important thing for this conference, for, uh, at least to me, for my participation, is that I went back to the motel and wrote down every word that she said in this long conversation and everything that I could remember, and because I didn't know what else to do with it. It was the first thing I'd ever written that wasn't assigned to me to write. And uh, by the end of the summer, it was 400 pages uh, about the experiences that I had trying to register voters uh, in that um, summer. 
By the way, the only three counties where I found people out of 20 that I could recommend for a voter registration uh, campaign were all headed by women, and they all had the same profession, which I would not have guessed in a million years when I went out looking for Martin Luther King. Um, they were all midwives uh, because they were independent and they had a certain amount of authority over all the families. And uh, these ladies would say, yes, you are coming to this meeting with this fellow. I don't care how young he is, because uh, I birthed you and everybody in your family. <laughs> you better show up. So, um, but when I went back to Princeton, I turned in this 400-page diary, and it caused a big stink. Uh, because I was supposed to write a policy memorandum, and I said, the, the experience I had doesn't translate into the language of policy. It was its own experience. And um, anyway, one of the professors sent it off to a magazine which published it. It was the first thing I ever had published. I got, uh, later, when I finished my degree at Princeton, I got a job at this same magazine. So my writing career started because um, I learned that summer something that became the rule for my trilogy over all the years, which is that I really believe that in race relations, we do not learn by abstraction and uh, discovery uh, in a platonic sense. Uh, we learn by interpersonal relations that makes us forget all the categories that we have to protect ourselves. I think most of the analysis about race relations is fool's gold if we think you're really going to discover something that way. Um, and therefore, I wanted to make all of my books as personal as possible to find out where the civil rights movement came from, uh, what made these girls tick. Uh, I, I, I felt that I wanted it all to be as personal as possible because I think that's the way people make discoveries in race relations. And I uh, also believe that you're not going to find it in the library. Um, libraries preserve generally what cultures are comfortable with, and we are by no means comfortable with race. And so you, you have to find it uh, by interpersonal connections with people, which is why some historians don't consider my work. They call it journalism because I do rely. I, I did a lot of library work, uh, but, I, but I also interviewed a lot of people in that intermediate zone between enough time, has enough time to pass to get some historical perspective and are enough people still alive to get a sense of what was really going on behind the scenes. So anyway, that's how I, I started writing out of this thing that happened with the moonshot. And of course, coming down here thinking of, of the moonshot made me remember that lady in Schley County. Well, that's incredible, right? So I, I think every journalist, um, you spent 25 years um, really chronicling America in the King years. And as you point out in this anecdote, I mean, there's so many rich characters around it and the, the Diane Nashes and the James Bevels, but King runs through it. Um, you probably don't, you know, hundreds and thousands of journalists have talked to you. I, I remember uh, a particular time I called you, the 40th anniversary of King's death in, in 2008. And, you know, this is something that I've always been wrestling with, is just the, the kind of sanitizing of King. And I remember asking you about it. I wanted to write about the more harder-edged King. And um, this is what you told me. Um, you know, because, look, I don't write anymore, so all I can do is read my old work. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I did. You said his challenge was much bigger than being nice. It was even bigger than race. It was whether we take our national purpose seriously, which is the full promise of equal citizenship. Why do you think that we have kind of, as a country, come to define King as, you know, not the color of, uh, of your skin, but the content of your character, and, and that's how we know him? Well, I think every historical icon gets sanitized to some degree, you know, chopping down the cherry tree or Honest Abe, uh, that sort of thing. I think some of it is inevitable. But I think that it's happened more with Dr. King than most people because I think his challenge went so deep to what equal citizenship meant, what voting meant, um, uh, to, to, to preach that nonviolence is the essence of democracy, not just because it's equal souls and equal votes, 
um, but because a vote is nonviolent. And uh, nonviolence is not just something for weird uh, Gandhian vegetarians who won't step on insects. Uh, nonviolence is what is the heart of your faith if you believe that we ought to settle differences by votes, which is the most distinctive thing about America. And yet, many people today um, don't want to hear that, and they think that the soldier on the front lines, believe me, I value our soldiers, but the soldiers are not the epitome of democracy. People have worshipped soldiers since Genghis Khan and long before. Uh, that's important, but Dr. King is trying to show us that the essence of our civic faith and the essence of our religious faith uh, are united in our commitment to something that's very deep and, and very hard to realize. It's an intellectual and spiritual struggle. And uh, we've kind of uh, slipped over that. And, um, and, and therefore, uh, people always, even when he was alive, people rarely challenged Dr. King and said, I disagree with you on the principle of what you're saying. They would always say, well, that may be true, but you shouldn't be breaking the law. You shouldn't be involving students in demonstrations. You shouldn't be questioning your country in a war. Uh, something to sidestep uh, the challenge that he was putting forward. But he, he kept raising those challenges that went deeper and deeper. You said, um, and you you mentioned this, and I think in the Mayborn Magazine interview, uh, that he was largely a marginalized figure by the time of his death. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Look, uh, nonviolence was the most powerful idea to come out of the movement, but it was also the quickest to become passe. People on the left sneered at it from uh, Mao Zedong, power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Uh, the press lionized black power and, and, the, and the frisson of, of, of violence. And Dr. King, because he was concentrating on poverty and because before that and the war, um, which made him unpopular even among other civil rights leaders, um, before that he went to Chicago. People don't, Dr. King went to Chicago to say we have a voice now coming out of Selma and he went a month later um, in April, he finished Selma in March of 65. In April, he was in Boston to test the first of seven sites for a northern campaign because he said, we have a platform to show America, now that we've got its ear, that the race issue in America is not now and never has been just about the South. Uh, and he did, and his aides all said, please don't do that because we're going to forfeit the northern press because they love us when we're in Selma, but they're not going to like us when we're in Chicago. And, and he went there and said that he felt and experienced more hatred in Chicago than he had in Mississippi. Um, but that was a sacrifice. He kept leaving these witnesses uh, about the fuller implications of what it meant to be uh, committed to interracial justice and the full meaning of democracy toward the end of his life. And for that reason, he was, he was marginalized. I remember myself, I was a senior at, at North Carolina um, with my mother visiting me in uh, April of 68. When he came there, we were in a restaurant and a hush went through the room when the waiters came through and said, Dr. King has been shot in Memphis. And my first reaction was, oh my God, this is terrible, but what's he been up to? You know, he was, he was not a front and center figure and had not been uh, for, for the last three years of his life. We, we did an HBO documentary last year uh, called King in the Wilderness based on my last book about the last three years of his life. And it's the period that is in some ways the most pertinent to today because it's all the issues today, but it's the king that's not. It's, you know, most, we tend, to, we tend to forget him after the eye of a dream speech and reduce what we tell students today in school to, you know, um, Rosa wouldn't get up and, and Martin had a dream and, and, and now we're here. Is, is there a leader today that reminds you of King? Well, John Lewis has been steadfast, my boss, the guy that sent me down to the VEP and laughed like crazy at all of us. Uh, at, all of my discomfort. Um, uh, but no, I think, I think there are a lot of women leaders that, sa that sound like Dr. King. I, 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 I don't know a lot of them but, uh, personally, but they sound like him a little bit. 
But no, I'm not, I'm not going to say. And I, I, Frankly, the, the thing about it was that was a people's movement. I mean, if you're trying to figure out, um, it was run, largely run by women, except when there was a microphone. <laughs> if there was a microphone there, then that's when the men uh, took over. Um, and to some degree, that is still true, but it is less true. And one of the things that um, uh, I wish that we communicated more how I know that we have our problems now, and I don't mean to minimize them. I think they're terrible. But we need to communicate to new generations how radically different the world is today. Even a room like this, when I was growing up in Atlanta, a room like this, because we're as mixed as we are, people's palms would be clammy for fear that the Klan would show up or the police would show up. I mean, we live in a world in which every breath is freer than it was. The thought when I was growing I went to North Carolina, there were no women there by state law except nursing students. And we don't communicate to younger people that they owe the civil rights movement for doors that were opened for women, for senior citizens. I mean, Dr. King was a visionary, but I guarantee you he did not imagine uh, marriage equality. That was on Pluto. In fact, women going to West Point was on Pluto. They couldn't even go to North Carolina. They certainly couldn't go to Harvard and Yale. Uh, the world has changed, and everybody who benefits from it and everybody whose daughter benefits or who's handicapped, disabled, uh, child benefits from the things that were set in motion uh, owes something to the civil rights movement, and we don't claim it. There's this huge disparity. After the civil rights movement, conservatives felt that they had been kind of dealt a blow. So they formed the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, the Federalist Society, and said we need to deal with fundamental issues and Conservative ideas, which is like a mantra. Everybody says wonderful conservative ideas. Well, the conservative idea was to keep segregation, to oppose women going into schools, uh, to oppose the Disability Act, to oppose um, women in sports. I mean, the Reagan administration called Title IX the Lesbian's Bill of Rights. I mean, all of these things happen, and, and yet there's a notion, because they're dealing with fundamental things, that, that there is an intellectual underpinning uh, uh, beneath the, the, the reaction in the last 50 years, whereas people who are the heirs of civil rights haven't done any of that fundamental work. I think we've been coasted. And in fact, what I, we don't even use the word liberal. It used to be liberal and conservative. Now it's liberal and pro, I mean conservative and progressive. I think a progressive is a liberal who doesn't want to talk about race. Um, that's, that's, that's my view because it was, it, was, it was disparaged from the left and the right. The black power people sneered at liberals and the conservatives didn't like liberals because of the race issue. That's what it was identified with. And therefore, liberals don't do the kind of intellectual work that we need to be doing about recapturing where, what is the legacy of the civil rights movement. Um, I have a whole long list of things. That, that need intellectual work. I mean, we fuss about gerrymandering. The court, the, co the court has no standard for what the opposite of gerrymandering is. What are ideal districts? It's basically, does it smell so bad that we're going to do something? And the court doesn't want to do anything because they don't want to be in charge of that. But nobody is doing the work of What would, be, you got all these computer experts and all these thinkers, what would the ideal districts be? I mean, my, my working theory is the shortest aggregate lines that make the most 50-50 competitive districts because that empowers we the people. That makes the voters. But nobody is working on things like that and we are satisfied with a vocabulary even on race where there are two words now, you're either a racist or an anti-racist. The most crusading academics I know talk about the necessity of being an anti-racist. Well, that is a negative, that doesn't lead you anywhere. We have very short conversations. Who wants to discuss whether you're a racist or an anti-racist? Um, we don't get anywhere with that. 
Um, you have short conversations. Uh, and race should, race is not at all of anything, but it's at the center of almost everything, and certainly American history and American politics. And so it ought to be something that engenders long conversations. And the question should be, how interracial is our life? How interracial, because we, uh, the first three words of the Constitution are we the people, and it's an incredibly optimistic, bold statement, the first sentence, which ought to be recited at the beginning of every debate, because it's, it, it's what we're about. And we're stuck in this thing where we discuss race when there's an emergency, a police shoot somebody, um, and we discuss it because it's an emergency, but we discuss it just enough to acknowledge it as an emergency and get back to regular politics in which race is, is dispersed. The way it is, believe me, the Federalist Society, uh, I'm writing about James Madison and race now, another thing, it's, he's their motto. They don't understand James Madison and they never write about race except to make a few disparaging comments about being politically correct. So people that are going to the fundamentals of, of what to do and raising, you know, what, what should America be like and what should its intellectual underpinnings are, don't deal with race. And there, there are just all of these topics that I think we have neglected um, in, in not trying to recapture uh, the grandeur and the challenge of, 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 of what the civil rights movement uh, produced. So 25 years of chronicling, you're, and you're the preeminent chronicler of, of one of the most important eras of in American history. What lessons have you drawn that apply to today's racial climate? Well, I, I think the, the, short, the, the quickest, shortest one to say is that what entranced me, the more I got into the, inter the people in the civil rights movement were at each other's throats all the time arguing over what to do on fundamental things. What, Dr. King said the deep wells of democracy are the only thing that we have to try to appeal to people who are cowering in their little um, uh, communities, afraid of black people. Um, we have to, what does the deep wells of democracy mean? And basically, they argued about it uh, all night. And as best I can figure, uh, in part going back to Madison, is they reduced it to self-governing public trust, that we're about being self-governing personally and collectively and building public trust which is a psychological experiment to go in the opposite direction of most history and all rulers trust themselves and govern the other guy. And the, the democratic experiment is built on the notion that we can govern ourselves and build up public trust. And, um, and that we can do it on citizen initiative. And for that reason, he was proudest when he was talking to freedom riders, saying you are the best in America when you can be on a bus and a, a Klansman gets on the bus and is gonna hit you and you say, you may hit me and, it, and hate me until the end of our lives, but what happens today will make our children have some sort of personal reaction be, because of what's going on here. It is the self-discipline of nonviolence and the public trust of, of, of making witness. And how to make that witness and uh, under what circumstances, that was the stuff and the grit of the civil rights movement from start to finish. So the, the short answer is I think they were grappling with the essence of what the democratic experiment is about, not only intellectually, uh, but personally. And, um, and that's what I think is, is, is lost today. We have all posturing. Uh, and that sort of thing, but it's got to be connected uh, to some ideas uh, about how we got here, and there are plenty of, of, of things to discuss that are fundamental that are being neglected, and I think being neglected by liberals as much or more so than by, uh, I'm from Baltimore. How many of you know Lena Wynn just, just fired as head of Planned Parenthood? Um, why was she fired? She says, I'm trying, I'm trying to make Planned Parenthood induce de uh, debate among women about the spirituality of health care broader than abortion 
and the, and, and the spirituality of, of abortion opponents who care about health care for women. She was fired, and I believe that it's because there's not enough, and I charge this to women because um, I think they, for, for natural reasons, should take leadership. There's not much fundamental debate going on, and certainly uh, a lot of uh, really, in the sense of soul searching, the kind of soul searching that you would have in the civil rights movement when Bob Moses, for example, and in Freedom Summer, they argued for a month whether or not they should bring down white college students in Mississippi where black people were getting killed just for trying to go down and register to vote. Um, this is the summer of 60, before the summer of 64. And they argued for a month over whether, the question was, how do you cease to become a victim without becoming an executioner? Because they knew that if they brought down these white college kids from Yale and Stanford and other things, that some of them were going to get killed. And that they were bringing them down there precisely because the country would notice when they got killed. And sure enough, on the very first night, you know, three of them did, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman. But they argued about, it, it, is this moral? Is this productive? Is this democratic? Is this in the spirit of nonviolence? What should we be doing? And they were in the middle of that argument when yet another one of their people who, had, who had, um, uh, was murdered. And they finally said, we can't protect our own people. All we have, the, the only way out of this is to say, to anybody coming down here, we beg you to understand what the danger is, and all we can assure you is that we are sharing the danger with you. And, and that was as close as they could do to get out. But this is out of, out of a month of that. So these are, these are people that are, 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 are wrestling with very, very uh, deep ideas in democratic history. And um, I, I have a long list of things that I think are neglected, but I, I don't want to get into those now. Well, now you raise it. So we're in justice in America is a the theme. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the most uncovered, unprobed topic in that area? Well, I think that there's room for people. Uh, there's. One that's not at the top of the list, but I just thought of it because I, I was thinking about whether to talk about it before I came out. I'll just mention, corporate governance is not a topic that people talk about. How corporations are, people complain that, that salaries are too high or that somebody does, but nobody's really saying, how are corporations structured? You have to get a, you have to get a corporate charter from the government. The government doesn't have to get a charter from the corporation. Um, because it's supposed to serve the public interest. But we don't uh, debate that uh, at all. But on a completely different issue, one of the biggest, we, we had the immigration uh, presentation this morning. I thought it was brilliant for, for any of you who's Sonia there. Sonia Nazario, for those who- It's very, very knows. inspiring and wonderful. Excellent. She's talking about, see, I think that the, the desperation that's driving those refugees here is related in a way that's not being addressed to the economic anxiety in rural America that is driving the Trump vote. I think that the fear of displacement and anxiety, it's always been there, but I think it's particularly acute now because you have the natural displacement of what when I was a grad student, Schumpeter called the creative destruction of capitalism, which, which puts you know, secretaries and telephone operators out of, out of business. Now truck drivers may be out of business you know, um, with self-driving trucks. Uh, it, it is a massive thing, but I think technology and globalization has, is accelerating that. And so it is a threat to people, and it's something that needs to be treated as something that's affecting refugees and uh, coming up from Central America, and it's also affecting people out in, in rural America. And it is part of our anxiety, but we're still just um, ca calling each other names. Uh, we have a... We have a, a, a a, a cynical. See, the great thing about the civil rights movement is that you had people who had every reason to be cynical, and they were the ones that were leading the country in idealism. 
um, in, in trying to pull up from the wells of democracy something that could be hopeful. And, um, and, and King was remarkable that way, right until the very end, he said, uh, he quoted Revelation 3.2, I believe, um, when he was trying to, in the Poor People's Campaign, he said, we must make, a, we must make an end on our principles, even if we have next to nothing left. Because uh, he wanted to leave uh, that witness. Um, the Poor People's Campaign, by the way, was based on the bonus marchers from World War I who went to Washington uh, at the height of the Depression because they were starving and they were driven out by the army, led by General Patton, uh, believe it or not, who was then a colonel. Uh, and a lot of them were killed. Um, and it didn't do anything. It was, it's a footnote. You may not have heard very much about it. But Dr. King's interpretation of history, it led a, d a dozen years later to the GI Bill, uh, which he said was the greatest collective uh, undertaking to benefit the middle class and, and to create the middle class, although it eliminated uh, black veterans uh, by and large um, because uh, that's, that was the Roosevelt politics. But, He's thinking about things like that at, at, at the very end of his life. So wrestling with fundamentals, the basics, uh, asking questions, figuring out how, how we address it uh, is, is something that is, is, is sorely needed. So let me ask you about craft since we're at a writer's conference. Um, your trilogy, we're talking 700 pages, six and 700 pages. How do you, for each volume, how do you keep a narrative compelling in that kind of space and, and length? How did, what, what, are the, what are the Taylor Branch tricks <laughs> to, well, to drive that trilogy? Well, I discovered a lot of new characters that I'd never heard of, like Abraham Heschel, and, um, to, 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 to make part of it. And, I think basically it, I was just continually enthralled um, when you get behind the scenes about what's going on, not what's shown on the camera, but what's going on behind the scenes to produce that. Uh, it's a pretty enthralling uh, drama, and I, if there's anything I tried to convey, it's, it's basically, I thought I knew something about this because I was an uppity college student and I really wanted to pay attention to it, but I had no idea of this, and this to me is a wonder. Um, so I tried to communicate a sense of wonder. Uh, and, as I said earlier, make it personal. If you can't, it, if any character becomes a cipher, I don't care if it's Bull Connor. You know, I tried to make, I tried to make people understand why Bull Connor thought that he was doing the civil rights movement a favor when he brought out the dogs and fire hoses, because his jails were full and he couldn't put anybody else in the jail. The kids had filled it up. They went from 13 adults, were the last 13 adults willing to go to jail on um, May 1st, to 600 children on, on May 2nd and 1,000 on May 3rd. And by then, he, he brought out the dogs and fire hoses because he said, I assume these kids will run away. And then I won't have to put anybody, these are children. And instead, they kept marching. And he convinced himself that it was their fault, that he had gone out of his way to do something to protect them. And until you can, until you can right or wrong, um, get some sort of sense of humanity behind uh, understandable uh, to make the characters uh, human, um, you're not telling a good story. So. Um, to me, the great paradox is that I think race demands some things that are personal, um, and, and, and yet it is used to wrestle with our greatest issues like you know, economic displacement, uh, democracy, uh, all of those things. How do we bring it to bear on, uh, on voting, on voting rights, on gerrymandering, uh, on, on all of these things because race, race is at the heart of it, and most of us live uh, less interracial lives than we should. Um, and, and it is our model to the world. It's what makes the world um, uh, still look up to America if we don't, if we don't squander it. Uh, you know, you guys are in Texas. Lyndon Johnson passed the Immigration Act of 1965 on his own initiative. Dr. King didn't march to Selma for that. It's because 
He, he squashed the, the, the Southern filibuster in August over the Voting Rights Act, and he squashed the same filibuster and the same people in September, a month later, to pass an immigration act that went from uh, basically, we only want people from Northern Europe. We don't even want Italians. Um, and we certainly don't want anybody from Asia. Um, uh, to one where he said, there, he said under the Statue of Liberty, there is no one on earth who is too foreign to become a fellow citizen. Um, and Johnson did that, and it opened up the world to communities, uh, opened up the United States to the notion that we really do have an idea-based, we the people, notion of citizenship uh, that we are proud of. If, if, you'll all be proud of it if you go to a naturalization ceremony. They're, they're amazing things. They're people from all over the world. Uh, and that's all under siege right now. I don't think, I really don't think that that will be overthrown on any long-term basis, but it is in danger. We'll switch topics. Um, your roommates with Bill Clinton uh, had a friendship with Bill Clinton. Um, in 2009, had a book that came out, The Clinton Tapes, Wrestling History with the President. And it was really an extraordinary exercise, late nights coming into the White House residence in, in secrecy, in, in a sense, having these long conversations with the president. Um, you told me something today that surprised me. You said it was your biggest failure. Yeah. And, and I wanted to, you to, ex to explore that and ex explain that. It, it, it seemed like it was just such an extraordinary um, memoir, diary of, of, of that time. But, but tell me why you think that. Well, I, I, I wrote it explicitly and said in the book that it was, it was about a president and, and about history. I was doing it as a historian um, uh, because he was not going to record his phone conversation. I think if we were a, a mature country, we would record every president and we would keep our hands off of it for 10 years. And then over time, we would learn what it's really like to be president so that we wouldn't be guessing at it and, and uh, that sort of thing. But since Nixon got thrown out of office, no, tape, no presidents have, have taped their conversations and he wasn't going to do it. So he's doing this diary to record the things that he wanted to say but couldn't say in public for when he's dead. And he did it for the whole eight years, saying if it gets out, it'll get subpoenaed. So we had to do it in secret. And he did it you know, from midnight to 2 AM once a month. Um, uh, and it was an incredible commitment on his part not that he was right or wrong on any amount of substance, but that if you're president and you're working until midnight and you, then you want to sit and, and, and rehash things with a historian, um, that was tenacious uh, or, or dedication of him uh, to do that. Um, anyway, I wrote a memoir of what it was like to do that, what it's like to be around the president when he's talking about something that is very upsetting to him or very... Uh, intellectually gripping. Uh, and, and then Chelsea would come in and say, please time me on my bi biology take-home exam, or, or, or something like that. Or Hillary would come in and say, um, as she did to me once, not to him, which I thought was very interesting, I've, Taylor, I've just had a dream about Henry Kissinger, and I would like for you to interpret this dream for me. So <laughs> there's all kind of stuff going on. Uh, in there, but to me, it's what it's really like to be president. And how does a president's mind work? Now he hasn't released the actual tapes. There are thousands of pages of, uh, of tapes yet, and I don't know when he is uh, going to do it. Uh, but I know he will because that's a tremendous effort uh, that would be wasted if nobody got to read these tapes. I wrote it, put the book out, and it was reviewed uniformly as either a kiss and tell betrayal of him because I put. The, the details of his personal life and what was going on and how he talked and, you know, um, uh, you know quirks and foibles. Um, or more frequently, it was viewed as a, as a defense of Clinton, that I was trying to rescue him and, and say that Monica Lewinsky didn't matter <laughs> or stuff like that. And the, the notion that it's about 
how we, what it's like to be president and what is, uh, how do we form our historical images that inform almost everybody's um, journalism. We're at a journalism. We read stories every day that impute, uh, impute motives to the president. Now, we, we put that in our journalism more. And it's basically, it's, it's all on the basis of what we think might, might be there. And a lot of it is, is, is based on myth. So anyway, the book, Clinton is so politicized that the, that the book that I had hoped would not be political uh, was politicized in its response. And uh, I was very, very upset about that. You know, I lived with him here in Texas, in Austin, in 72, and didn't see him for 20 years. He, he and Hillary and I, he brought his girlfriend down here, Hillary. And we lived here for six months. And I, I saw Hillary uh, a good bit, because she was back in Washington, where I went back into my journalism career. And she was on the, uh, the impeachment committee in uh, Watergate. So I saw her. And we would have lunch, and she'd say, Taylor, he wants me to marry him, but he insists I go back to Arkansas. Have you ever been to Little Rock? Uh, so I knew she was going to do it anyway. It was rough. But I didn't see him for all of this time until he was president-elect. And out of the blue, I got a call from his office saying, will you and your wife come and meet the president-elect? He, he has something wanted to discuss. And I, what is that and when? And they said they didn't know. Um, so I said, sure. So we went down. It was at Kay Graham's house, the president of the Washington Post, in Washington. And it was to introduce the president-elect and his wife to the establishment of Washington. The joint chiefs were there, uh, at least one or two Supreme Court justices, all the big journalists, um, of course, at Kay Graham's, and us. And we were way in the back. It was outdoors. And you hear this big commotion going and lights and you can see journalists um, and the, the Clintons come through and they made their way through this entire crowd right over to us. Um, and we were stunned. Um, and he takes two Secret Service agents and kind of plants them against the crowd, turns to me and says, can you believe this? <laughs> like, it's been 20 years, but I'm still the same guy, you know, and I've got all this. And then he said, I read Parting the Waters. I read the footnotes, and there are a lot in there from presidential libraries. Will you talk to the, my cabinet officers about what kind of records they're going to keep and give me your unvarnished opinion about whether a historian 50 years ago can use those records to do what you're doing for Kennedy and Johnson? And by that time, the, the wall gave way, and he was swept off. And in 30 seconds, he had said, I'm the same guy, and he had said something that was incredibly cerebral uh, about history. He hadn't even taken office yet, and he's thinking about um, records for history and connecting that to some, a lesson that he drew from the footnotes in one of my books. So I did those interviews. I went and interviewed the people coming into his government, went back and said, it's a disaster. They're not, they're not going to keep any notes. And George Stephanopoulos said if he did, he'd take them home so he could use them in his book. And Tony Lake, the national security advisor, told me that he didn't believe in notes because Averill Harriman had told him that that was a way of going to jail. He did everything on the telephone. Um, so I said, this is terrible, and you're not going to be able to record your conversations, which is the most indispensable and wonderful primary record. Go to the LBJ library and listen to some if you want. You can do them on, online now. They're incredible. I had to trans, transcribe them myself. Um, so I told him he needed to do um, a diary or something. Um, because it, it was going to be bad. I said, there will be a mountain of paper from your administration, but it won't have an ounce of humanity in it. Uh, it'll be very hard for, for historians to recover anything that, that, that had the, has the feel of human nature. Um, so anyway, he, he tried to do an oral, he tried to dictate, and he said, God, I start dictating, I, I dictate an hour on the same thing. Uh, I said, well, that's why oral history was invented. Um, to, to try to bring some discipline to it. And he said, well, until I train somebody on my staff, will you come down and do it? So that's how it started. And then he, and then he said I, he didn't trust his staff. Um, and uh, because they were, he said, they'll leak it quicker than anybody, and then it'll get subpoenaed, and it'll be trouble. So uh, he kept these little, I would rewind the cassettes, and he put them in his, I put them in this little box in his sock drawer. And we kept it secret for eight years. Um, 
I, that may have been one additional reason. I, I know that there were some reporters who resented the fact that we kept something like that secret for eight years. Um, but I don't think that was the reason. It was not me. I didn't. I didn't resent. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Resent. Thank you very much. Um, but, I'm sure you want to ask questions. I don't know how we're doing on time, um, Neil. I got one more, and then I know Ben wants to ask. I know Baxter. I got. I got all kind of people want to ask questions. Donna Britt. But but let me ask one other, just to tee up the sports dimension. Tomorrow I know Patrick Ruby and going to have you on a panel, uh, and you're going to be talking about the NCAA, so I won't go into it here, but I was at the ESPYs uh, recently. Bill Russell got uh, the award, the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage, um, and, you know, obviously he's a pivotal figure. You wrote, co-wrote, um, essentially his memoir back in 1979. Um, you know, athletes today have, have kind of been in the forefront of, of activism and as a result of the influence that they have through social media and others, they've really kind of leaned into that um, a lot. I wondered what you thought, um, knowing Russell, what, what could the modern athlete learn from Russell's example? Well, um, I lived with Russell in his basement for most of 1977. Um, it was an amazing experience. I, he didn't trust me at first. I, I, had to put a <laughs> I had to put a tape recorder in his golf cart because he played golf every day. And if I'm going to do this book, I had to, I had to get out there um, with him. But what I really learned from him was uh, that the two most important things in his life were integrity and humor. And he wrestled with both of them uh, all, all the time. He was, he was very thoughtful. He was deeply wounded that American culture pigeonholed him as a jock. Uh, in fact, that's the reason he didn't trust me. He thought I had a secret bargain with the publisher to say I was going to help him write a memoir that was about his life, but I really was just going to write about what it was like in the locker room with Wilt Chamberlain or whatever, you know, that it was going to be a, a, a sports book. Um, and I had to win him over um, with that. But his integrity and his thoughtfulness, um, he, he, he told me that he never got very far in sports until he really started thinking about it. And he said he developed a theory that every sport was some mixture of art and war. Um, and that until you understood that if it didn't if it didn't have art it would fail and if it didn't have war meaning competition he said those little cute gymnasts that you think are so artistic will cut your heart out to <laughs> to beat you uh, and he, and he thought about that and visualizing it and, and um, all of which was a real surprise to me and 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 his family and how he um, could articulate visualize things on a basketball court and uh, make it uh, entrancing even to me, and I'm not much of a, of a basketball fan. He lived through a very tough issue. He went, era, he went to Mississippi when he's six foot 10 in 1964. Uh, he, he stood up for Muhammad Ali, um, um, and, and he endured um, some of the most hateful, uh, vicious race bashing in the city of Boston. Uh, that left a scar on it. I was very proud in a small way. To, I thought he would never reconcile with Boston. He always said, I played for the Celtics. I did not play for Boston. He said, Boston is a hate-filled city. Um, and, he, and he was always asked to go back and throw out a, a first ball at the Red Sox Stadium. And he said, why would I do that? I, you know. And he turned them down for years. And finally, Larry Lucchino, who, the, one of the owners of the Red Sox, said, what do we have to do to convince you that we're serious about wanting to make amends for what we did? And he said, now you've asked a question. I have to think about that. And he called him back. He said, I called him back, and I told him, if, if you can do something about mentoring, which is what I really care about, that's not just writing a check and showing that you really care about that in a year or two, uh, I would reconsider it. And he said, 
two years later, I had to do it because the, the Red Sox were on the board of the National Mentoring Institute, and they were running things all over the country. And he said they had turned me into a liar if I didn't do it. So he went and threw out the first ball <laughs> at, uh, at a Red Sox game about three or four years later and allowed them to put a statue of Russell uh, there outside in, in downtown Boston. So. Um, he wrestled with a lot of pain, but he did it with integrity and, and wit. And um, uh, I still winced time. You know, I would, um, we would go out to dinner occasionally. We didn't go out much because the publisher was hounding us to get the book out. Um, and many, many times fathers would bring their children over and say, Mr. Russell, would you sign this uh, for my son? And he would always say, I don't sign autographs. Um, and, they would, and they would look hurt. And I would wince and say, oh, come on, Bill. Uh, and, and he'd say, I don't sign autographs. Um, it's from my life's experience. If you would like to sit down, I will talk to you and talk to your son. And I'll get to know you, and I'll buy your dinner or your dessert if you want to have dessert. But I'm not going to sign an autograph. And they would always leave, and they would stomp out, and he would say, the autograph was for him. It wasn't for his son. The whole thing was a charade. Um, I'm trying to make this into a lesson that the important thing uh, in any encounter with somebody is to make some sort of human contact, and an autograph doesn't do it. Um, and I didn't have the, um, it was hard for me to accept, but uh, ultimately, I could, uh, I could understand it. Now, for me as a writer, we were at a writer's conference. I did the Bill Russell book not because of race relations, even though by that time I was aching to write to start on Martin Luther King because that's what I wanted to do. I did the Bill Russell book because I was trying to break into book writing, and in those days, the way you did it as a ghost writer was as a ghost writer. And, uh, and, it would, and I had done John Dean's book about Watergate, Blind Ambition, lived with him and said, gosh, a real writer is a novelist. And what does a novelist do? He writes in the, in the he inhabits characters that are different. And a ghost writer is like a practice for that because you're writing in the voice of John Dean. I want to pick the person that's as different as possible from John Dean, and then I'll be ready to write a novel. So. That's how I did the Bill Russell book. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. We became lifelong friends, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. But I then pronounced myself ready to write a novel, and I wrote one um, that got a couple of decent reviews but sold about 500 copies. So I went back into, uh, into nonfiction. And until, and by the way, in those days, publishers would tell you, Americans do not buy books about race. Um, and um, they sure don't buy fat books about race. And you, you write fat books, so this is going to be bad. And then when I turned in the first chapter, it was about Vernon Johns. I don't know if any of you know anything about parting the waters, but it's about Vernon Johns. And my publisher had an absolute fit. They said, you have one thing going for you that a lot of Americans are curious about Martin Luther King. And you turn in the first chapter that's about not about Martin Luther King, never even mentions him, is about somebody nobody ever heard of. And um, I, I said, well, the reason I did that is because I think as a matter, an intellectual matter, the movement came out of church, black church culture. That's where it came from. And I felt I couldn't start this story until I communicated something about it. But my first rule was no essays personal stories. I can't write an essay about the culture of the black church and the relationship between the minister and the deacons and the women and how they're organized and, and how, the, how, the, how the black church substituted for so many institutions that were, that were prohibited. It was, it was like the newspaper and the insurance company and the entertainment and the congressional hall and city hall. It was all wrapped into one. Um, but I, I, so I was stuck for months, and then I found this character named Vernon Johns, who I thought you could tell his personal story and communicate everything you needed to know to be ready to understand what it meant for Martin Luther King to take over the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. I was just there last week, by the way, again. So it was a big gamble, 
uh, on my part. And um, um, so I was upset that the publisher didn't want to do it, but then I was grateful that they let me do it uh, because uh, I started out uh, with Vernon Johns, who did not exist in libraries. You know, he was, he was a living legend in black preacher culture and, and an amazing character uh, and an enthrallment for me. But I wandered off on other topics. I'm sorry. Ben or whoever, live for the question? Mites? Test us. Uh, I was curious, uh, I'm glad Kevin asked you uh, for an example of what's on your list of things we should be talking about. Uh, and you mentioned corporate governance. Yeah. I just wondered what you thought about Citizens United and the way uh, campaigns are funded today and whether that affects civil rights. Certainly it does. Our corporation's people. Um, we the people, it's, it's one sentence and the verb, if you listen to the, to the verbs in the, in the preamble of the Constitution, it's just, it's just amazing and it ought to really shame us for the, I thought I had my list of things to do in here, but I'm, I may have thrown it out. <laughs> We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, um, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. One sentence. Listen to those verbs. Listen, I mean, <laughs> written by Governor Morris, who was uh, an incredible rake uh, aristocrat, uh, but, and it was all an intuition because the, we the people then didn't mean a lot of people, but it was an intuition about what me the, we the people meant, and it was a place to ground it. And um, you know, we really drift away from that. I wish that they made the candidates recite that at the beginning, because it would be harder to, to, uh, to sneer and dog whistle and everything else if you just recited the preamble of the Constitution that you're supposed to be um, working on. I know I had my list in here. <laughs> I may have thrown it away. Anyway, maybe there's another question. I think there is. Yes, there's one right here. I just wanted to remind people who wanted to ask questions, there's a mic over there that you can um, access and then one right over here that you had a question. Uh, over here, Taylor, to your area. Yes. Um, so you, you've obviously chronicled um, and witnessed some of the most challenging times uh, in American history. I'm curious, given your experiences and where we are today, how you uh, reconcile with it. If it's something that you're surprised by, saddened by, you expected, and if there's anything that's happening today that or, you know, makes you feel a certain way about moving forward, if you're optimistic, if you're more cynical, if you think you know, the history of race has led us to this point and there's no coming back and this is just how it will be or any of that. Well, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, I, I believe that by historical analogy, it's a hell of a lot easier to be optimistic today than it was for Martin Luther King to be optimistic in Alabama in 1957 when uh, he, he spoke at a rally for somebody who was executed for stealing three dollars um, in a time when, when black people were invisible. Um, Having said that about optimism, you know, I, I, I do think that we're at the end of a cycle, um, and not the first cycle, because after the Civil War, when we passed three amendments in four years to deal with race, 13th, 14th, and 15th, and promptly put them into a sleeper hold, um, we, we, we undid a lot of that stuff as far as our memory and everything. That's, part of what I'm writing about now. Well, I think we did it again in the 1960s after setting loose all of those things that are still bearing fruit today. I don't believe we're gonna, 
we're going to recriminalize uh, gay behavior and, and, uh, and kick women out of West Point uh, and the University of North Carolina and most professions um, uh, and, and, and eliminate, you know, NCAA didn't sponsor a single female intercollegiate uh, sporting event until 1982. Um, we're not going to go back to that when they literally said that if women ran up and down a basketball court, their uterus might fall out. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a different world. But I do think that the, by analogy, that what ha what's happened in the last 50 years to, to what happened after the Civil War was that when it was no longer respectable to be an overt segregationist, it became respectable to cuss the government that was telling us that we should live up to the promise of civil rights. And that that developed into an art um, that would win elections, um, but feed cynicism, cuss Washington, and what it was doing, and so on and so forth. And it, it, it's dumbed us down. Uh, and I think the press, to some degree, plays a role in it because the press is naturally suspicious of government and wants to make fun of it. And so there's kind of an alliance between a, a press that wants to always emphasize corruption and what's wrong in government uh, w w without the purpose of why we're exposing that. It, it, can, it can become a thing in itself. Um, so if, you, if you've got a... If you've got an erosion and, a, and a, against the promise of government that is racially driven but is not explicit, over time what's going to happen is that it's going to be less and less effective because people are going to say, we have real problems. What's your constructive agenda? And if you don't have one, you're going to have to get more explicit in what's really driving you. And I think that's what Trump is. I think he is, I think he is exposed what has been implicit in a lot of the anti-government cynicism about, uh, uh, about we the people. And that we're at a crisis now where we're either going to come out of it or, he, or he's really going to do long-term permanent damage to the institutions of our country. I don't think it's likely that he will, but I am less um, certain of that. You know, it's... Uh, um, we, we need to see people talking about the Constitution and the higher essence of patriotism, not just who's a racist and who, you know, trading. Chart. Nobody wants to believe. That's his ace in the hole. If we call him a racist, then people who support him are going to say, I support him because if he's a racist, then I might be a racist. And I don't want to be a racist. So you have, I, I think we're kind of at the end of the road. And the road is either going to get a lot worse, or I think it's going to turn. But it, nothing happens automatically. Nothing happens unless we make it happen. And uh, I think the, Dr. King's lesson is that um, you know that it's our responsibility. You know, one of the greatest things about him, he was the first and only adult civil rights leader who, the day after the sit-in started, February 1st, 1960. And remember, King is only at that time. 31, <laughs> so he's not that much older than the students, but he, he said instantly, this is a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough because these students have realized that there are certain things, even in America with our democratic traditions, aspects of human nature where words alone and credos are not enough, that they have to be amplified with sacrifice and witness by citizens. And that's what these students did when they sat down at lunch counters. And um, he said, one of the days the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage. He always put one foot in the Constitution and one foot in the scriptures, um, which gave him tremendous balance. And that's one thing that's lacking. You know, We don't do that in our discussions of abortion or corporations or immigrants or anything. You know, where is our foot in the Constitution? Where is our foot in the Scripture or whatever you're... Uh, it's hard to win if you disparage the spirit. Um, I'm not talking about religious dogma, but if, 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 you're, 
if you're aggressively against religion, you're, you're, you're building up your, um, your obstacles in politics. So I, um, I think we're at a turning point. I'm more worried than I've been for a while, but I've been for a long time wondering why is it that we can't capture the lessons from the last time we really encountered the guts of democracy and, and so much good came out of it. Uh, how have we let that lapse? Why isn't it front and center? And um, so um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Thank you for your conversation. It's very enlightening. Um, I was curious because you talked about the need for dialogue on the, on the two opposite sides um, today. Back in the civil rights, obviously there was a lot of, even on the same side, a lot of different methods between Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, um, Martin Luther King. How did, how did you see that kind of transpire, and was there something specific that drew you to King's method and going about it? Um, well, King's message re resonated. You know, it resonated for me as a kid, and then when I started as a scholar, quite frankly, um, I admire King infinitely more now than when I started. Um, there was part of me, the Princeton grad student part, that thought that he got carried away with turn the other cheek and kind of stumbled into something um, uh, and grossly uh, underestimated uh, the strength and stability of, of what he was doing. But Malcolm is the same way. I, I, the story of Malcolm is my middle volume, uh, Pillar of Fire, has a lot about Malcolm, and he is not known. He's the, the, the main thing about him that he's not taken seriously is he's not taken seriously as a Muslim. His religion is not taken seriously because people don't really care about it, including most of his biographers. Um, and Malcolm turned himself inside out many times, and his relationship with King is very, very complicated, I mean, with the idea of King. You know, he went to Selma less than three weeks before he was killed to see King to go down there and say, I have disparaged you and ridiculed you for nonviolence, saying, watch what happens if they ever give us reason. You know, we're, we're men. Anybody can sit. An old woman can sit. But it takes a man to stand up, and that's what we're going to do. And then, and then he didn't do that because he was under orders not to. And he said he wanted to apologize for um, hurling invective when people were really on the front lines. And even if he didn't agree with um, nonviolence, he respected the people that were down there struggling for the right to vote. Um, they were terrified, of course, because Malcolm was an was a incendiary figure. And he shows up out of nowhere in Selma. Um, and he walked into Brown Chapel to speak, and they allowed him to speak. And uh, he, <laughs> James Bevel, introduced him, and everybody thought Bevel had lost his mind, which he may have. Um, but he said, I know what Malcolm's going to say. He's going to say that the white man stole me out of uh, Africa, stole my ancestors, murdered my father, took away our, our language, took away our religion, took away our humanity, enslaved us, brought us over here, put me in prison, turned me into hating myself, turned me into a junkie. He did all that to me, and if he steps on my toe one more time, I'm going to do something. So we ridiculed. People thought Malcolm X was going to explode, and Malcolm X comes up to the, to the pulpit and said, Brother Bevel is a wise and brave man. I'm here to talk to these children to say I came down here I don't agree with nonviolence, but I do respect what you're doing, and I came here to say that and to, and to pray that God or Allah will take all the fear out of your hearts. That's all he said. That Malcolm and, and that interaction over the efficacy of violence and nonviolence and, and the conversion from Christianity to Islam and what it meant and the promise of Islam, we're still dealing with cartoon images of Malcolm in which people say he, he went to Mecca and discovered that there were white people and it was an epiphany. Yet, I mean, Ma Malcolm was shrewd. He knew all of that. You know, he was so far behind, uh, 
ahead and more sophisticated than most of our images for him. So um, work is still to be done on that. He's a very, very, very interesting uh, character. His ally, Wallace Muhammad, is the one that took over the Nation of Islam after his father Elijah died. I think Wallace Muhammad is the most underestimated religious figure um, in the 20th century for what he did with the Nation of Islam afterwards to build uh, the Islamic community in the United States and with the avowed goal to prove that democracy is, is compatible with Islam in the long run, even though Islam uh, grew up under the most autocratic regimes on earth. He said, look, we're no worse than Christianity and democracy were in the 17th century when it was all kings, um, and, and, and we're going to get there. So um, uh, there are a lot of wonderful stories in here, and, 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 and Malcolm is one of them. And with right. that, um, a hand, please, for Taylor Branch and Kevin.